and welcome to this edition of my two cents worth this is the section of the channel where i give you my two cents worth on something please subscribe to my youtube channel hit that subscribe bar when the notification bell pops up click on it you'll be notified anytime i add content to the channel comment on these videos like these videos share these videos and this edition of my two cents worth is brought to you by god grace and you a book written by me and published by 21st century christian it's a great study on the uh, doctrine of grace. It's not really a, a proof texting scholarly. It's more of a uh, class study, individual devotional time type of book. But it does get a little bit scholarly, I think. You can order it from 21st Century Christian by going to their website. And there's the web address. If you happen to be in Middle Tennessee and would like to drop in, they are located at 4108 Hillsboro Pike, Suite 200 in Nashville, Tennessee. And you can give them a call at 615-383-3842 if you are uh, in the Nashville area. If you're outside the Nashville area, toll free 800-251-2477. And the fax number 615-292-5983. They are open uh, if you uh, want to pay them a visit. Monday through Thursday, 830 to 430 Central Time. Fridays, 830 to 4 Central Time. Customer service is available 8 to 5 Monday through Friday central time again and they are closed sundays and saturdays and all the uh, major holidays and if you are really uh, into the 21st century and high tech amazon.com or if you still are lucky enough to have a local uh, mom and pop or family type uh, bookstore uh, give them a chance to earn your business order through them and help out your local economy all right let's get on with it we've been looking at the idea of preparing for worship in the first episode, we looked at the audience and what the audience needs to do to prepare for worship, such as planning your weekends. Worship should not be something that's third or fourth or fifth down the activity depth chart. Uh, yeah, I don't have to work today. Uh, I can't get a golf time. It's not fishing season. Uh, the house is pretty clean, doesn't need anything. Okay, yeah, I guess we'll go to church. It needs to be number one on your weekend activities and everything working around it. Number two, get a good night's sleep on Saturday. But this is particularly for the young people out there who like to go out and have a good time, see a movie, hang out with your friends. You got to be rested and ready to go. If you would not uh, stay out really late before going to work, say at two or say till two or three in the morning, uh, before going to work, before making a major presentation at work before taking a test at school, then don't do it before worship. Make sure you treat Saturday night uh, as a night to stay home, get ready, uh, get your clothes ready, study your Sunday school lesson, which is number three on the list. Uh, study it, look ahead. In fact, I am teaching the class tomorrow in our Sunday school. I uh, prepared my uh, lesson, read it, and got some notes and things for a class for tomorrow. And I did that in about 45 minutes. And I'm going to look at it over again tonight. Obviously, it's Saturday. It's Saturday afternoon right now. And I'll be looking it over again tonight before uh, I go to bed and make sure that uh, I've tied up all the loose ends for that class. So I'll probably start to finish. I've spent about well, maybe an hour, hour and a half max preparing for it. And then select and prepare your clothes. I already mentioned that a little bit, but make sure you've got things ready to wear. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know what your tradition is or the tradition for the church where you are is. I don't have a problem with someone coming in in jeans, jeans and a hoodie or whatever. I'd rather have you there in your jeans studying and learning from God's word than in a suit and tie down at the country club having brunch. Okay, and, and uh, if your church has a problem with jeans, then they probably need to lighten up some. And in the second video, we looked at the preachers. Preachers, you got to prepare. You got to be ready. Uh, make sure that uh, you've got the kinks worked out of your sermon. Have them prepared for to six or eight weeks ahead of time, or at least have an idea. And then uh, prepare it. If you use PowerPoint like I do, then you need to get in there and rehearse it so you can bring your A game and give them an A plus uh, uh, sermon. And I mean, yeah, we're all going to have our off days. I have my off days. I've had those sermons I've preached and thought they were garbage. And for some reason, those are the ones people seem to like. Hey, that's the best sermon I've heard you preach. Hey, that was really good. It, it really spoke to me. It, you know, I get that a lot on the ones that I think are bad. And then uh, song leaders. Song leaders have got to uh, prepare. Here's this guy leading singing here. Uh, song leaders have got to prepare. 
Uh, preachers, if you can, if you know what your sermon's going to be, try and get some ideas and some suggestions to the song leader by Wednesday or Thursday. Song leaders have a list ready to go when you come in. If you can't make it, if you're sick, if you suddenly have to go out of town on business or some emergency comes up immediately as quick as you can, get on the phone, text, call, email somebody and get a replacement as quick as you can. Uh, and then the uh, prayer leaders, here's a guy here that's uh, in prayer. Uh, think about your prayer. If you've got the opening prayer, that's probably a good time to talk about the sick uh, and uh, maybe our community uh, reaching the lost, that sort of thing. Make a few talking points or write out a prayer. I've known a couple of people who did write out prayers. One uh, brother in particular who wrote uh, out his prayers, very eloquent language he used. And he would make sure to get the sick in there. I mean, he spent hours laboring over these prayers. Don't necessarily have to do that. I typically, if I know I'm going to lead a prayer, I typically will get a copy of the bulletin, write a few talking points down there, uh, maybe a few uh, complete sentences, and then go up and, and say the prayer. And it, it seems to go smoother that way than getting up there and repeating a bunch of canned phrases that you've used all your life. And then an MC. Now, this is an idea that I got when I lived in Canada. Uh, churches up there, my Toastmasters Club, a lot of public uh, functions have a person designated as the chairman or chairperson, if you're going to be grammatically neutral, genetic or uh, uh, gender neutral about it. And that person is basically an MC. They call the meeting to order. Uh, in the case of Toastmasters, that's the person that would have us raise our glasses and drink a toast to the Queen in Canada. We had water in our glasses, okay, so don't blow a gasket. We weren't consuming any alcohol. And then at church, the uh, chairman would call us to order. He would uh, make the announcements, and then he would uh, say something about the Lord's Supper. And then the, uh, something unique to Canada that, uh, well, I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. We're going to get into the Lord's Supper here uh, in just a minute and what... Um, what uh, should be done uh, for that. So in this edition, we're going to look at the Lord's Supper and how to uh, carry that out, how to prepare for it, the importance of getting a replacement before uh, you take off to go on a trip or uh, an emergency, and then enthusiasm. We'll talk about all that here in just a minute. Now the Lord's Supper. Let's look at our presentation of the Lord's Supper. I knew a man once that whenever he was presiding, and we had, uh, in that case, I think uh, five people, including the, the I'm just going to call him the chairman, okay, uh, the, including the chairman. And what this individual would do is he would get up there, he'd be centered, he'd have two on this side, two on this side. He would always look to his right first, look to his left, look to the audience. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father in Heaven. He always started off his prayers, Our Heavenly Father in Heaven. I don't know where else Our Heavenly Father would be, but anyway, I digress. He never said a word about what we were going to do. Now, just think about it. Here is Joe uh, Citizen, uh, who lives in the neighborhood, and just decided, you know, I think I'm going to go down here to the Church of Christ. I, I've been thinking about going to church, or I know someone who goes there, so I'm just going to show up. So he comes in very quietly, sits on the back bench, and then somebody hands him this cracker. Okay, everybody else is taking a piece off it. Um, okay, take a piece off and pass it to the next person. And okay, now if we got this little thing of, what's this, grape juice, wine? What is it? I don't know. All right, everybody else is taking it. So hey, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Pass it on. That's exactly pretty much what happened to me the first time I went to a Church of Christ. I was with some friends, though, who were more faithful churchgoers than I was. They didn't go to the Church of Christ. They went to uh, a chapel out on, uh, out on uh, the army post. But they had an idea of what communion was about, okay? I didn't. I, did, I didn't know what this was. I had seen communion. I think we did it the first Sunday of the month out at chapel when I was going out to the base. and. Most of the Baptist churches that my relatives went to, I believe, if I'm remembering it right, did it on the first Sunday uh, of the month. But that, I really didn't know what it was. And so this is, this cracker, this juice has gone by. What just happened? Well, he has no idea. Meanwhile, you've got brother and sister better than you sitting up there who uh, have taken communion. Now, you remember 52 times a year. 
times 20, 30, 40 years that they've been a Christian, literally thousands of times. And they're probably sitting there, something like this. You're not sure if they're awake or asleep. They might be thumbing through their Bibles, maybe the songbook. Down at the other end of the pew, there, there's their nephew, and he's sitting there, and he is writing notes to the person next to him. Or if he's a 21st century kind of guy, he's texting somebody, making out his grocery list, slipping a note to someone, hey, where do you want to have lunch today? And they have forgotten the significance and the importance of communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, breaking of the bread. So I said all that to say this, if you are the chairman, if you are the MC, if you are the presider over the Lord's Supper, you need to take about a minute, maybe two minutes, and explain what is happening. In my early days as a Christian, I would just flip over to one of the gospel accounts of uh, Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, or maybe go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's okay if you want to do that. That's fine. But now looking back, I don't think that really did what I would now want to accomplish. I want to say something that is going to get you, the audience member, thinking about the Lord's Supper and get you meditating on it. J.J. Uh, Turner wrote a book called Supper with the King, and it's some meditations about the Lord's Supper. Now, some, they're mostly long, and so I usually take one and I'll edit it down a little bit. Uh, you can go online and find meditations about the Lord's Supper. It doesn't have to be long or elaborate. Just something that will explain to you know your your Joe uh, community member who just walked in what we're doing and why we're doing it, and something that will get the members who've done this hundreds, maybe thousands of times to refocus on the communion, the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and what it means. And then, of course, in the audience, you've got to put down your phone. Put down your pencil and paper and listen. And maybe look up a Bible verse or a poem or something that will help you focus on the communion while the elements are coming around. Now, how are we doing communion these days? This is the old-fashioned way, what you see on the screen here. This is the way we did it before COVID. We would pass the uh, plate with the bread first and then pass the little individual cups of juice. Now, since COVID... This is what um, has come about, this, this um, where am I, right there, this uh, little uh, uh, chalice, mini chalice, and right here is what they call the chiclet, that's a little piece of bread that comes around. Now, I visited a church not too long ago where they had these in the regular communion uh, cup, or communion tray, like you see over here, and passed them around, and everybody took one, and then we waited. Uh, until everybody got them. Uh, way, the way we do it, where I preach, is these are in little individual Ziploc bags, a snack size bags, and they are put in a container. And as people come in, they can pick up one. And then when we have communion, when they're done, they can put it all in the Ziploc bag, seal it up, and put it in the trash on their way out. Uh, that works too. Whatever is going to work for your congregation that's what you, I mean, COVID is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. I don't know if all churches are going to go back to the old fashioned way here with the trays uh, and the uh, open top trays that, that are passed around. I know a lot of people who do like uh, that and want to get back to it. I personally like the way we're doing it now, but that's just me. Uh, if it came down to a vote of some kind, I would be voting to use the individual chalice and the chiclet but I might get outvoted and that's just the way it goes. So it's not anything to split a church or create a fellowship matter over. So if there's something about using these uh, individual chalices that bothers you, quite frankly, you need to get over it. Okay. Welcome. This is where we've got to make sure visitors get greeted. And I'm not saying from the pulpit, hey, is anybody visiting with us? Would you please stand? That is what visitors do not want. And speaking as someone who did not grow up in a church going home, I didn't want to have people ask me to stand. I would do it just to go along to get along, but I didn't, I didn't like it. And I once had a roommate come to church with me. He wasn't a Christian. 
And he told me ahead of time, if they ask visitors to stand, I'm not doing it. And I said, well, that's all right. I'm not going to bother me any. And finally, to help create a meaningful worship environment, enthusiasm is a must. Visitors must be welcome. And I had a survey once. It was sent to me by a relative. And the, it, the, the title of it was, How Visitor Friendly Is Your Church? And I went through one Sunday, and I pretended I was a visitor, and I checked everything off. And it was a church where I was preaching, and that church was one point away from being visitor hostile. And I used to get, when I got up in the pulpit, especially if I knew there were visitors in the audience, I would say something like, if you're visiting with us, uh, stick around afterwards. Give us an opportunity to get to know you. And I got told uh, after doing that several times, you know, I don't understand why you're so concerned about visitors. You know, you're always telling them to stand. Well, what's the big deal? So you can probably figure out why that church used to be about 300 members and it's about 50 now or 60. It's something like that. Because they really were not welcoming to visitors at all. In fact, that was a place where I got a phone call one day. I had a couple come to visit. They had come back from an overseas mission field. They weren't members of the Lord's Church. They were in a denomination of some kind. I, I never did figure out what. And they were sitting there on the audience right on the center aisle, about two or three rows from the back. I stopped, chatted with them a little bit, invited them to stay for a potluck we were having. They declined. They left uh, after the closing song. Monday or Tuesday of that week, I got a phone call from the husband, and he said, I just wanted to tell you, we're not coming back. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, he said, nobody spoke to us except you. And we would have stayed for lunch if somebody besides you had invited us to. And that church had gone from 300, at that point was about 130 members. We never had more than about 104 or 5. About, uh, if I'm doing the math right, a third or so of the church would be gone every Sunday. Uh, and that's maybe another another story for another video, another uh, two cents worth. But they weren't. This couple was not going to come back because nobody spoke to them. And I got lectured whenever I talked about visitors and the importance of them. That's how you grow a business, folks. You get referrals. You keep your customers happy, and they come back. And I have also here been told I uh, that 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 it bothers some people when I talk about business terms with the church. But hey. If you want it to grow, sometimes you got to think that way. I'm convinced if Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and people like that ran Microsoft or Apple computers the way that most churches are run, we would still be using IBM Selectrix. They would be selling computers and software out of their garages or out of the trunks of their cars. But they use their heads and came up with marketing strategies to get their products to market. We've got to figure out a way to get our product to market, the gospel. Now, we don't have to go in and do invent a bunch of stuff and violate scripture. We can do it and be scriptural. And that's where the enthusiasm comes in. When I, years ago, in fact, this has happened more than once. I'll talk to churches that have, let's say, 500, 600 members. And that's their Sunday morning attendance. Okay, what's your Sunday night attendance? Oh, maybe 100. What does that say to our neighbors? If I get up and I go to church Sunday morning, but Sunday night I'm at home watching the ball game, or I'm, I'm reading, or I'm working in my garden, that's telling my neighbor, you know what, church isn't really all that important. We have a gospel meeting, we have a VBS, we have a seminar, and I just go Sunday morning and don't even bother to try to get to the rest of it. What is that saying? It's saying that I've got God in this little box at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, whatever, on Sunday mornings. That's my God time. The rest of the time, no, I'm not there. I'm not enthusiastic about it. I don't care. I'm apathetic at best. So we need to get more uh, enthusiastic. When you get up there to make the announcements, to get things going, there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying a good, good morning. Now, I don't always, I, in fact, when I get up to preach, I don't do that. That's just not me. But if it's you, do it. I had a church one time, and, and, and if a woman says good morning back, she is not being out of order. She is not usurping authority. I had a church one time that I was talking to, trying to set up an interview, and they called to ask me some questions, which is normal. And the first question he asked was, do you, when you get up in the pulpit, do you give a hearty good morning? And he almost sounded like he was trying to imitate Robin Williams from Good Morning Vietnam. I said, no. 
Oh, uh, well, okay. Because we we're concerned that, uh, if that happened, maybe a woman would respond. Long story short, I didn't even go for the interview there. But that's not being out of order. That is not uh, usurping authority. Now, having said all that, if the elders or whoever the leadership is, the business meeting at your congregation has said, we don't want people giving a good a Robin Williams style good morning from the pulpit. Okay, don't split the church. Don't create a fuss. Just honor their request. Okay, there, you know, the elders are, are in charge. You honor their request and you leave it at that. But there's really nothing wrong with it from a biblical standpoint. Serving in public worship is a privilege. It should be a happy privilege, not a burden. Occasionally you'll hear, hear stories where the preacher or somebody will call on brother stick in the mud. Would you uh, say the prayer as we're getting our class going? No, nope. you've called on me too many times. Get somebody else. That actually happened to me once. I had a guy that he was a good prayer leader, especially leading prayers off the top of his head. So I called on him a lot. And one day I said, damn, hey, uh, Brother Blah, would you uh, say the prayers reading class going, nah, man, you call on me too many times. Get somebody else to do it. Which, by the way, is rude. And don't put your teacher or your preacher or whoever on the spot like that. If this is the 10th uh, Sunday morning or 59th Wednesday in a row they've called on you to pray. If you don't want to do it, go to, go ahead and lead the prayer. Just, okay, sure, I'll be glad to do it. Let's all pray together and do the prayer. And then afterwards, go to him and say, you want to give some of the other guys a chance? There might be somebody else who wants to pray. So you present it that way. Don't just go at him snorting and say, will you quit calling on me? I'm tired of it. I've been called on 937 times and I'm sick of it. Call on somebody. Okay, that's the wrong attitude. In fact, at that point, you're done. If, that, if I'm the preacher, I'm the teacher, you're done. You will not be called upon to pray. You won't be called upon for anything with that attitude. Okay? Have a good attitude. Be uh, uh, Show some excitement. And sometimes, let's face it, preachers, you know what I'm talking about. There are Sundays you get up in the pulpit, you don't want to be there. Maybe I'm just not feeling it. Okay? I, I, I You know, it's a nice day. out. Actually, it's overcast and been snow flurries all day today. And and uh, maybe I would rather be out fishing. Or maybe it's a great, gorgeous day. I'd like to take my kid to the park. Maybe I'm not feeling well. I got up with an upset stomach or, or a headache or a little bit of a fever. Oh, it's a fever. I should stay home. It could be any one of those things. But when I step into that pulpit, I've got to show enthusiasm. Like, hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Now let's study God's word. And then when it's done, I can go home or into my office and collapse on the couch or collapse into my chair in the office. And you, it, it, however you want to do it. But when you're out there in front of the audience and you're presenting your sermon, you're presenting, uh, you're leading singing, you're saying the prayer, you're making the announcements, be enthusiastic. Let people know you're glad they're there. And if there are visitors, you make sure you greet them. If there is a wayward member who hasn't been out in weeks or months and he comes in, you, you do not approach him sarcastically with, huh, look who decided to uh, come in today. Uh, well, what's the matter? You couldn't go fishing? Oh, man, look who's here. I hope the building doesn't collapse on us. Greet them. Hey, brother, glad to see you're here. Come on in. Why don't you sit with me? And do that with visitors, too. Why don't you come on up and sit with us? Uh, you'll have someone to sit with, and we can help you out explain what's going on. That would be a whole lot better. I recently made that mistake. We had a lady who had been coming. Uh, that's, again, another story for another time. But she had been coming a couple of weeks, and I got wrapped up in a special class that was going on. And I went to my class, and I just kind of took her into the auditorium, sat her at the back, and told her who was teaching, what they were doing. I should have sat, sat there with her. She had a whole family that was looking for a church home and uh we lost an opportunity and you know it's just the way it is hopefully one day she'll be back but what do you think about all this leave your comments in the comment section below if there is something you would like me to address here on uh, my two cents worth or maybe in a sermon then uh, send it to me at 2 timothy 4.2.3 at gmail.com and you need to allow at least eight weeks for delivery. I'll get it out as quick as I can and at my discretion I'll do a minute message or a, my two cents worth or maybe do a sermon on it. 
That's all we have for this video. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next video. I'm out.